still happen sometimes. So our approach to creating an immersive world on the audio side relies on a set of coherent rules uh, that are applied to everything by default. So we consider what does the environment sound like, how are sounds affected by the environment, but also how does the environment respond to the sounds that are played back within it. The majority of our natural world ambient audio is driven by audio zones, ambient zones. These are placed by sound designers and define an activation volume and a playback volume. And when the player is in the activation volume, the zone is active. When it's active, it will trigger sounds randomly positioned within the playback volume. Rules are used to define when and how often the sound is allowed to play. That might be time of day dependent or weather dependent, that sort of thing. We don't use any streams for this. All of our ambience is uh, sequenced out of sounds. And this helps ensure smooth transitions. Um, we really want to avoid any hard cuts. We don't want to cross a threshold and hear something start or stop. So by breaking it all down into small parts and sequencing them positioned in the world, it ensures that as you move through the world, you hear a natural evolution of sound. And I hinted earlier, everything, it's important to us that everything in GTA sounds plausible. So any sound in the ambience has to be something that you could conceivably come across in, in the game. Ideally, everything should be around the corner or one block away, so you're never aware that it's not associated with something that's really happening at that moment in the game. And you might have noticed, probably didn't, in GTA 4, we didn't have any dogs in our ambience track. You never hear a dog bark. If you've been to New York, you obviously do hear dogs bark. Um, but we didn't have dogs in the game, so it would have broken our world if we had included the sound of barking dogs. It was a very good day when we added dogs to uh, GTA 5. <laughs> So our overall approach in GT4, as I mentioned, was really similar. Um, that's the map of four on screen. We created 86 zones, 57 rows, about 200 meters. Uh, you can probably guess where the next slide is going to go. <laughs> so yeah, we created a lot more, safe to say. Um, we had to optimize a lot of systems to enable that growth. 11 times the number of zones, 21 times the number of rows, and uh, two and a half times the static emitters. But actually, on GTA 4, we use static emitters for a whole bunch of things. On GTA 5, they're only ever used for um, music placement, so radio emitters. Um, so yeah, massive growth. We also extended our zones to support different shapes uh, and orientations. So on GTA 4, they were all axis aligned boxes. Uh, in 5, we support spheres, and the boxes can be orientated arbitrarily. We also added support to our rules to support more complex positioning systems. So we can now have a sound which tracks a line that's placed in the world, which we use for um, some waterfalls and pipe systems. And uh, we also have a fall listener mode where the sound is positioned at the listener if you're inside the zone, and it's left at the nearest point on the zone boundary if you're outside the zone. So the sounds that are played back within the world are affected by a consistent set of rules. And it's important that those rules are consistent because it helps create a world that's really believable. So our standard distance behavior applies a combination of high-pass filtering, low-pass filtering, and we increase the reverb sounds with distance. So sound that's further away should be more diffuse when it reaches the listener. We can override all of this per sound, but we typically don't do that very often. We don't, well, sorry, I should say we override the scale all the time, so we control how loud a sound is and therefore how it should, you know, how much of the environment it should fill, but we rarely change the curves themselves, and we try and stick to the same behavior where possible. Our equation system applies uh, low-pass filtering and also reduces directionality, so the panning becomes a little less discrete if a sound is occluded. We have two different occlusion systems, one for interiors and one for the outside world. On the interior side, it's a nice story. We've got portals and we've got rooms and we can track the path that the sign should take through those rooms. And that allows us to do repositioning if a sign's occluded at the nearest portal, work out the best path, that kind of thing. Um, sadly, in the outside world, we don't have any of that data. So we have to rely on um, line of sight probes and we can't afford very many of those. In fact, our entire occlusion system uses around five probes per frame, um, which makes it quite difficult to, um, to uh, get you know, really extreme results without the risk of being broken. Generally, when presented with a, a problem like that, we will always take a more conservative approach. We don't ever want to get into a situation where you hear a sound 
be acquitted when it shouldn't be acquitted. That's far worse than a sound not being as acquitted as it might be if you, you know, if you were really there. Um, so yeah, we, we tend to tone things down a little bit in the outside world. We do form an equation volume around the player based on these probes, and we do um, filter sounds uh, accordingly, um, but we, we have to err on the side of caution there. We use a number of custom reflection techniques where we get a lot of value from it. So one example of that is uh, gunfire. We author custom echo sounds, and uh, they're positioned um, based on the environment. So maybe a tall building or something like that, we'll find a reflection point and position the echo sound there. And for the vehicle that the player is driving, if you enter a tunnel, you might have heard in the intro video there, um, we do position two uh, reflection re uh, delay lines, variable delay lines, on the edges of the tunnel. Um, so the, the uh, delay time is based on speed of sound there. So if you drive toward the edge, the wall, um, you'll hear the Doppler shift on the reflection, which is really cool and uh, really sells the space. We don't use any traditional listener reverb um, at all. Our reverb is entirely source-based. Uh, ideally, we would be able to create completely bespoke reverb for every source, but obviously that's impossible or not affordable. So instead, we approximate this using three four-channel reverb buses, a small, medium, and large. And depending on the environment that the source is in, we'll um, send to you know, some combination of those to create the, uh, the response we're looking for. Um, because these are four-channel, they can obviously be positioned in whatever way uh, we, we want, and we can position the dry separately to the wet where, um, where that's useful. And it's also important for us that the environment responds to the signs. So the natural ambience that I talked about, um, there's natural ways it responds to loud signs. Birds might freak out if you fire a gun. Dogs might bark, now that we've got dogs. Um, but we also use it for a dramatic effect. Um, we'll hush insect beds in some situations when you fire a gun. And this really makes it feel eerie and puts the player on edge. We tag up resonant objects in the world um, with their resonant sounds. So these are things like metal dumpsters or shipping containers. And these sounds are triggered based on percussive transient sounds in the world, like a gunshot. Um, if you fire your weapon next to a shipping container, you should hear that ring with sympathetic resonance. And uh, because these are tagged to the objects, they're positioned nicely around you. And as you move through the space, you get, um, you get a nice uh, response there. We tend to keep that stuff very subtle, very tight roll off, um, but it, it, it does add a lot. And for objects that rattle, chain link fence being a great example, we'll tag those sounds up with a rattle element and apply shockwaves to that. So shockwaves, we trigger from explosions. They're just a very simple sphere that grows over time. But we also attach them to loud vehicles, helicopters and trains being good examples. So if a train starts to arrive at a station, you'll hopefully hear um, bins sitting on the ground start to rattle um, as it approaches. This kind of tagging clearly requires a lot of effort. Um, I mean, we talked about the size of the audio assets, but the size of the game assets um, is, is also crazy. So it is a massive amount of manual effort, and the reward is relatively subtle. Um, but it does go a long way to helping the world feel, feel more solid and uh, immersive, and ultimately helps us create the, the sort of depth um, and subtlety that we're, we're striving for. So that is the end of my talk, right on time. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I think there is some time for questions now, if anyone has any. Or maybe everyone wants lunch. Do you want to uh, There's a mic, sorry, if you don't mind. Um, Thanks. Hi. I think you said you had like 30 sound types. Is that what you called them? The, yeah. Um, how are those created? Is that a purely code thing? or? Um, yeah, so we have 31. They're created by programmers um, based on sound designer requirements. But they are a combination of code and data. So you define um, the parameters for the sound type. Uh, the UI for the tool is driven entirely based on that. So there's a data component, and then there's the runtime code component that implements the logic.
So I just want to say thank you for sharing this. I think it's really amazing to yeah. hear how you guys did this, and I think Thanks. you're light years ahead of anything in procedural I've ever heard. Hmm. Um, thank you. So it's really inspiring. Um, I was wondering, how did you, what, 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 how much, um, how difficult was it to get all that procedural audio to be high performance? Because it seems like that's a critical element. Sure. Uh, you mean the synthesis stuff in particular? Yeah. It was. Um, I mean, it was always the plan, obviously, that it had to be high performance. So the whole thing was engineered from the ground up with that in mind. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was a key consideration, certainly, um, because we implemented an architecture that um, was pretty quick to run. We didn't actually have any trouble. In fact, we were pleasantly surprised with the amount of processing we could afford once we had the tools in place. Um, but yeah, that was because it was performance first um, from a design standpoint. Thank you. Hi, um, great talk. Um, I have a question about the uh, vehicle engine rendering. Um, sure. Were you happy with the granular system that you created, and what would you do to improve it in the future? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, we were certainly delighted with um, the improvements comparing to previous GTAs, um, and I think the cars sound, sound really good. There's a number of improvements we'd like to look into for the future. If we had more memory, then inc improving the variation would be great. So currently, we have a single acceleration and deceleration asset, which is OK, because the physics is always a little bit different per gear and depending on how the user is driving. But it would be very cool if we could afford different layers, maybe throttle-dependent layers. So we have part throttle, full throttle, um, and uh, maybe different gears, that kind of thing. So I think variation would certainly be a, an interesting thing to push. Thanks. Thanks. Hiya. Hi. Um, in terms of bank management, sure. um, how did you deal with obviously such a large amount of assets mm -hmm. streaming in? And also in terms of engines, if you've got the player car as granular, the rest of the guys as rev bands, mm -hmm. if you don't know what car someone is about to jump into, do you quickly yeah. dump stuff? Yeah. And mm -hmm. Sure. So yeah, we tend to create pretty custom solutions for each system from a streaming point of view. Um, for, on, the, on the car side, we have a single player bank that we can load in, or a slot that we can load into, and then we have, I think, six or seven NPC slots that we can load into. So yeah, if you start getting into a vehicle, we'll very quickly try and grab the, the asset for, for that, the player version of that car. Um, thankfully, the animation of getting in takes a little while, so we usually have enough time for that. Um, I don't think I've ever heard it. I mean, it could fall back to the NPC version, but I don't think I've actually ever heard that happen um, because you know we, we get the data in time. Um, we we've always got a few seconds seconds there. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what type of um, mixing technique were you using when, for example, you're driving the car and mm -hmm. there's a radio station going on, and mm -hmm. then you might be also talking on your cell phone. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of different elements happening at the same time. Yeah. So there, were, were you using like a hierarchy of like ducking and mixing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. We, we duck the radio um, sort of automatically for any, converse, any scripted conversation, any scripted dialogue. So um, we take it down 9 dB or something, I think, automatically if anyone's talking. Um, for score, we sometimes do that if we need to, although we prefer the score to be sympathetic to what's going on. So if there's a section in the game where people are going to be talking for a while, um, we'll pick a score uh, mix that's not too uh, invasive there. Um, but yeah, ducking is always our, our fallback for that stuff. Um, also, one more question was about the radio stations. Mm -hmm. There's all, um, a given amount of tracks per each station. Yeah. So I was wondering if what kind of engine or uh, mechanism you were using to not have it loop in a certain way where if you enter a car, re-enter a car, it might be playing like the same track. Sure. It, you know, that there's some kind of randomization in that. Yeah, that. yeah I mean, that's something that we, we worked really hard to maximize the time between hearing the same track on the radio as much as possible. So our radio uh, stations are broken up we actually have two types of radio station, dynamic and mixed. Mixed stations are where we work with a particular DJ and he produces, a, or, or she, produces a really cool mix, um, which is a single entity. Uh, those we have to just keep playing and um, looping, but they tend to be long enough that hopefully you don't hear repetition. The majority of the stations are dynamic, and that means 
the tracks, the music tracks are individual assets, the adverts, the um, DJ banter, including lines that, where the DJ speaks over the intro. Right. Um, so those ones we mark up intro regions and outro regions and we have separate speech for the DJ and he can speak at the correct point. And uh, the adverts and the idents and all that kind of thing are, are separate. And we track the history on that. So we just ensure, um, like I said, we maximize the time between, uh, between hearing repeats. Um, unfortunately, uh, that doesn't work very well for multiplayer. And in GT mm -hmm. Online, we do sync the, um, the uh, radio tracks. So you, you should hear what your mates are hearing. But obviously, there's no way of ensuring you've not heard that track in a different session recently. So. Well, congratulations. I think that's a monumental <laughs> achievement. Thank you. Hey there. It was a uh, great talk, great game. Uh, quick question about the dialogue. When you guys interrupt the dialogue during mm. the sequence, and then yeah. you pick it back up, it's always, you know, between words. It's never in, inside yeah. of a word. I'm wondering if you set those hit points in advance or you have something yeah. procedural. No, that's all manual. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it makes a massive difference to Huge. it feeling natural, doesn't it? But um, sadly, that's just a lot of uh, a lot of work. Um, we tag up uh, repeat points, we call them, throughout right. a line of dialogue, and um, those are the the re are the resume points, I guess, where we can pick up from again. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, I was just thinking a little bit more about what you said. Uh, actually, one more question. Sure. Can you give me a general number about um, uh, the amount, the budget on the CPU and the SPU that was dedicated to audio? Um, so I think. I think I'm right in saying that we had about one SPU um, for audio, and that was everything. So that's all the mixing, DSP, but also all the sound processing, and um, and yeah, not including the game level stuff, I guess, but all the engine level stuff. I th I'm pretty sure that was about one SPU, and that includes MP3 decode as well. Wow. And on the CPU? Uh, none, virtually. Wow. Okay, mine is severely blown. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, Real-time audio synthesis module is so cool, but uh, how much required uh, the system required CPU, CPU the, power? The GPU power. Yeah, we're not doing any GPU power. Uh, the only CPU. CPU. Oh, yeah, sound, sound memory or CPU to gen generate the real-time audio synthesis. Mm. So how much CPU are we yeah, using? Yeah. Is that the question? Um, yeah, so on PS3, it's about one of the uh, SPUs, and that's... Um, that's to do all the audio. I think it's, um, if I remember rightly, it's maybe a quarter of that is PCM mm -hmm. generation, which is our MP3 decode and our synthesis and things like that. So how much that sounds, uh, uh, how many sounds uh, can call uh, simultaneously uh, those uh, Real-time audio synthesis, audio synthesis sounds. So how many? Are yeah, you yeah, yeah, at once? yeah. Uh, There isn't a fixed limit. We have a fixed limit of 96 physical voices, which are voices mm -hmm. that are rendered. Mm -hmm. um, all of those could be synths if it happened to be the case where 96 of the loudest sounds in the game were synthesized. That won't ever happen, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, the overall um, budget uh, is um, is. Is, well, it fluctuates basically how many things we're playing. It's entirely dependent on uh -huh. on the assets. So, like I said, the air conditioning unit sample that I, or the synth that I like here, um, that costs the equivalent to about one and a half MP3 decodes. So, if we were playing a sample, it, we could do you know one and a half of of, of those per uh, per aircon. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. I think we're out of time. So, thank you very much.